Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. So we're back for another Tornado Tales episode, and this time we're with a former Tornado F3 navigator, Tony Dixon. So, Tony, can you share the story you've got for us today? Yeah, certainly. I, does, <clears throat> I thought we'd talk about something uh, that I did, did back in the back end of 1993 when we went down to fly out of Italy to do Operation Deny Flight over Bosnia. Uh, we went out, my first flights were in December, although looking back, We'd done some helicopter fill back in August and September and also some night vision goggle work uh, back in November before that. Uh, basically, looking at my logbook, I did about 60 to 70 percent of all the flights over Bosnia in the dark. Uh, not, it's not that difficult. It was winter time, so it was dark at four o'clock in, in the afternoon. Uh, so, yeah, about 30 hours a month, uh, of which 20 odd were in <clears throat> night time. <clears throat> Slight problems uh, in as much as we were doing it intercepting helicopters. Not an easy thing to do in a tornado, basically. So the, the sortie profile, which you get airborne out of a place called Joy de Col, which is <clears throat> just south of Rome and in the middle bit towards the east. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we go up and do some TriStar tanking over the Adriatic and then go... Uh, to quote Black Adder Sausage Side, <laughs> and just bimble around seeing what was going on. There was an AWACS up there. He could see uh, anything that was flying. But after a couple of sorties, we knew where the helicopters were operating. There was one down in the southwest corner. There was using a floodlit football field, big stadium. Mm. Uh, and you could see the helicopters on it. And if you went over every 10 or 15 minutes with the night vision goggles, you could see whether the rotors were running or not. Otherwise, it was just flying around as a pair. Now, the curious thing is that if you look at an aircraft going, or like an airliner going across the sky, it's always ahead of the noise. So if anybody wanted to shoot at you in the dark, and of course we had lights out, they shot at the noise. So you didn't fly like that. You flew like that. And it was quite often, if you were in number two, you'd see these tracer shells with your night vision goggles uh, going behind the leader, which is about where you would be if you were lying astern. So that was definitely a no-no. Uh, and you'd fly around. You'd also report any ground activity, um, you know, shelling of each other with uh, tanks or whatever, because a shell produces an amount of heat. Heat produces night vision stuff, so you could see anything that was going on. And mainly there were boring sorties. Interesting to see and interesting to look at. Uh, a couple of times we did manage to go and chase a helicopter. Um, we, five squadron, we were the <clears throat> second uh, station team to be out there because um, we were then using 11 and 23 and 25 squadron aeroplanes. And if you intercept an enemy aeroplane, in inverted commas, the standard internationally uh, agreed way was to come up on the left hand side and waggle your wings that's when you see these aircraft next to the bears and they're always on the left hand side one of us then worked out that hang on a minute in an aeroplane the captain's on the left in a helicopter the captain is on the right so we had to change the whole rules so that we come and intercept the aeroplanes by coming along the right hand side now, two things you shouldn't do when you're intercepting a helicopter is go as fast as it, because it's not very easy. And we also didn't know whether they had miniguns or even uh, shoulder-launched SAM missiles. Hmm. Uh, so flying alongside at the same speed was not a good idea, especially because if they were low level, they might be leading you towards a, 
and somebody on the ground. So effectively what we did is we flew past uh, and we'd staged ourselves in a figure of eight racetrack at about 400 knots, lights out, and we'd pick up the helicopter on radar and we'd fly past it to a reasonable distance, normally engaging the burners as you went past because all they, they nice. didn't see anything, so we had no lights on. Um, um, the one night I do remember, which was in early December, uh, this helicopter got airborne from this site, and I can't remember the name of it now, and had gone up into the hills. Beautiful moonlit night, and all the hills were snow-covered. So it was, it was like daylight, effectively. So you could see this helicopter, and we were just zooming up and down for about 10 minutes, and then it turned round and went back to the place that it had come from, where there had been two other helicopters. And spookily, there was then only one other helicopter on the ground. <laughs> So another one had got airborne, <clears throat> probably too low for the AWACS to see, and uh, and had gone off and done whatever. So that was the general thing. We used to fly around in the mid-teens, height-wise, um, because that's out of range of a, of a, a SAM missile. We thought they only had the basic SAMs, which were rear quarter only. We found out there were some instances that they had the advanced SAMs, mm. so they could fire at you as you were going towards but we you generally reckon if you're doing 400 knots with a an early version of the sam 7 if he fired at you you would outrun it before it caught you so that's why we basically said 400 knots was the minimum uh, and those were it three and a half hour sorties we'd la launch as a four ship two would take the north two would take the south um after x amount of uh, minutes one of the one of the pair will go to the TriStar, do some tanking, and come back, and then you go off and do some tanking and come back. So there's always aeroplanes uh, over Bosnia. The one of the interesting ones is uh, I looked on it was December the 31st. Uh, we actually got airborne in the light for about half an hour, and then the rest of it was dark four hours, and there was all sorts of shenanigans going off. There was uh, missile, no, anti-tank. They were trying to blow up one farmhouse with this anti-tank gun. Um, wow. And there was all sorts of firing going on. And the curious thing was that the BBC said one person had been killed in Bosnia that night. Not a chance. It was probably a good big firefight. Hmm. But then, of course, we came back to Joy de Col uh, and finished. And we got back about 11 o'clock just in time for the New Year celebrations. Now, the Italians go for it in a big way. Fireworks and everything else. Uh, and their light show was actually better than what we'd seen earlier on over Bosnia. Um, oh. But, of course, it was all fair stuff. And we were, we were sat on the roof watching it. So, yeah, it, it was good fun. But uh, other than that, I missed out by a day. If you remember that... Um, the Bosnians launched about six aeroplanes, they, they think, from a site somewhere towards the south of the country. Um, but they hadn't been there. They, the initial thought was that they trucked these aeroplanes about 100 miles around from the north to the south. Mm. Uh, and they got airborne and were attacking um, a town, effectively. Now, that is a hostile act. and we can, People can then shoot at them. Uh, and American F-16s did, uh, and I think they they shot down at least two. Uh, where the other four went, nobody ever knows. Where they landed, we don't know. Um, but the interesting thing is I was actually on that slot the day after, uh -huh. which is a bit annoying. I mean, the American F-16s, very uh, agile, very uh, adept, but it only has a couple of missiles and doesn't have the firepower that the Tornado had. And if the tornadoes had been up there as a pair, we probably would have got more than uh, two uh, and we'd have seen seen what happened. But I think half the time we assumed that the Bosnians were not very intelligent. That was not the case. They knew exactly what was going on. Hence that uh, uh, helicopter getting airborne, going one way and coming back and the helicopter had gone the other way. I mean, the NATO, the, uh, NATO AWACS, um, as soon as we reported that a helicopter was, out, was running or got airborne, they broadcast on the guard frequency that, you know, helicopter getting airborne at such and such a place, 
uh, you're operating, contravening the deny flight agreement, blah, 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 land immediately. And they never did. Hmm. It was, uh, <clears throat> it was just one of those things, but it was, it was, uh, it was very pleasant. How can it be pleasant when uh, people are actually shooting at you? Um, yeah, it was low, low to medium risk. I think <laughs> at night time, the chances of actually getting shot by anything uh, were minimal. They did have a couple of SAM-3 sites, which were radar guided, uh, but we knew where they were and we avoided them, effectively stayed out of their uh, their radius and we just flew around um, and, and spent three or four hours mainly at night. And we did that until the 1st of March from the 1st of first, yeah, effectively the 1st of December. Mm-hmm. Um, That's brilliant. And just like a couple of uh, questions from me here, Tony. So, yeah, you, w- with the um, the night vision goggles, would you be would you be wearing them constantly, or would you flick them up when you're you know looking down at the radar on, on your the, side? Uh, it was interesting. The the guys from Germany, uh, the Phantom guys from Germany, used them. A, a pilot basically has to have them on all the time, right? Uh, because you you haven't got a spare hand. I use them like a pair of binoculars, effectively. Right. Um, I mean, your lights were dim in the aeroplane, mostly on red, so you could see what was going on. Because I needed the dif- the difficulty was the night vision goggles have got a sort of of a, an infinity focus, and I'm trying to look here at the radar <laughs> screen in front of me, which is green, uh, and therefore night vision goggles with green, which look green with a green screen, it just <laughs> didn't work. So, yeah, I was just using them looking over the side. In fact, I took a pair of my own binoculars with me for the day sorties. Oh, wow. And they proved very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why that wasn't adapted more, to be quite honest. If you've got a reasonable 10 by 50 pair of binds, um, you could see a lot more than you could from 15,000 feet. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. And yeah. when you were going up for these sorties, did you feel nervous at all? Was there any like trepidation, or was it just like almost like a normal sortie in the UK? To be blase about it, it was sort of like a normal sortie in the UK. All right, we carried weapons and we carried survival stuff on us, um, but the threat was minimal from them. Uh, I know one of the American guys did get shot down, but he broke all the rules and went round again and was at low level mm. and, and everything else. Um, we think he got set up. You know, they, they, they threw a helicopter up and he went and chased it uh, and then went round again and went slow yeah. and went low in the daytime. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a setup, basically. But we didn't. May I say, most of our flying was at night uh, with lights out. Yeah, she, they could obviously hear us and they could possibly shoot at us. But as I say, if you shoot at the at the noise, you're way behind the aeroplane. Yeah, yeah. And how many aircraft were based there in crews uh, over that at the time? Well, we had a full squadron out there. Um, oh, wow. I think it was 12 crews. We had an That was <laughs> one of my slight gripes is that I didn't get a medal for being in Bosnia. Oh. Uh, most people got medals. We had an extra crew. So what we did is after a month, we started staging people back for two weeks to the UK mm-hmm. to, to do it. I happened to be the middle week. So I did six weeks there, two weeks back, six weeks there. And you had to do eight continuous weeks to get the medal. And right. they, they said that the boss tried to argue it at the end. They went, no, you weren't there for eight weeks uh, in one continuous bit. And therefore, that's it. Hey, huh. <laughs> that seems a bit strange. But uh, oh, in, that yeah, t- yeah. in that time, did you, you and the crews get like downtime? Like you know, like did you get to go out on Friday, Saturday night, anywhere, anything like that? Um, we didn't fly every day. I'm just looking at. It. So I, I was basically on every other day, right? Um, or I'm, I was flying every other day. Whether that was whether that was the the number. Of, say if we had twelve crews out there and you only flew six or eight sorties. Um, in two four balls a day, you know that that was it. Uh, I remember my my golf did improve. We went there's a, <laughs> an American American base. I can't remember the name of it now. You know that like Chick Sands have got all those aerials in the big. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There was one of those uh, just down the road, which had a golf course on. So uh, whenever we could, we got away uh, and just enjoyed ourselves. Basically, it was good. 
And was there no security risks in that? You know, you being an RAF air crew going out, you know, out and about and stuff like that, or was it just well, do what you want? You're in Italy, you know, so the Italians were on our side. Um, I, I don't know whether most of the Italian population knew why we were there and what we were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that the Serbs or the other side or whatever sides they were on were actually interested in doing anything outside of the country right, that they were yes. fighting for. Right. You know, it's uh, I mean, like Iraq and Iran. Um, you flew out of Saudi or whatever, but uh, apart from the odd time when they did try and send some missiles over, there was no great security from on, from ground stuff. No, no, <laughs> it was good, enjoyable. Yeah. So, how long did you actually spend? Con uh, like, you know, from like, was it weeks, months? How long did you spend out there? It was there? three, three months, six, six weeks, two weeks off, and then six weeks. So, right, so that was your time. And, and then we handed over. I'm pretty sure to 29 Squadron because uh, we, I was on five <laughs> at the time. Yeah. And uh, and then they did it. So yeah, it was. Uh, it was doable. The unfortunate thing, it was the only Christmas I ever spent away from home, to be quite honest. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And obviously back then there was no Skype or, you know, phones and no. stuff like that. Was that difficult or? Uh, it wasn't the easiest of things. To... Well, it was what you were used to. Yeah. I mean, if all of a sudden you lost Skype and all your mobile phones, everybody would be going, oh, my goodness me, what am I going to do? How am I going to talk to people? <laughs> but then, of course, you didn't. Um you could you use landlines? You know the uh, the landlines in the hotel were in use pretty constantly, and I think you were allowed. I think there was a time that you were allowed, um, but that was about it. Um, I know there was a big rumor that two big rumors: one that the hotel was uh, going to build a swimming pool. <laughs> Apparently, it still hasn't. Now. <laughs> um, and we are pretty sure that it was actually owned by the mafia. Really? Oh yeah. It was, well, <laughs> ma most of southern Italy is, so it was. That's not really a surprise. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was an air crew hotel and the ground crew hotel. Uh, they were. We were a little bit out of town, so we basically stayed in the hotel in the evening. They were in in town, so I think they went out to the local bars and pubs, and did it that way. Yeah, just like, just while we wrap up this episode of Tornado Tales, did you actually uh, mingle with the ground crew, uh, ground crew, even in general as air crew, like over your oh, career? I, I, I always did, yeah. Um, I mean, because I played rugby all the time, I played with most of them yeah. uh, on the rugby field. So, yes, I was. I, I always wanted to talk to ground crew. Unfortunately, in Italy, the only time you could do it was actually when you're on base, because yeah. you lived in separate hotels. Um, but, say, Cyprus... You mix, you mix with them quite a lot, and on any of the other detachments. Certainly, in Falkland Islands, because it's a smaller group. You know, day daytimes operations. You 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 mix with them quite a lot. Mm. Yeah, which is what you should do. Absolutely. I mean, you know, they. You're only a better this rank thing. You're only a better rank than them, because after the war, the air force had to start paying air crew more money. So that the civilians wouldn't nick them for the more money. Mm -hmm. That's why we we then lost sergeant pilots and they all they made them officers. Um, but and that became the difference. You didn't pay ground crew that much because they learned <laughs> on the job um, and they got better. But you know, a chief tech or a warrant officer or a flight sergeant was equally qualified, if not better qualified, than you were. Eng certainly engineering wise yeah so you you know you had to respect them for that and if once you knew guys well you knew the good guys you knew the ones who actually did a good job and told you if it was broken it was broken mm -hmm. or if you do this you might be able to get away with a couple of sorties if you didn't have a spare for instance mm -hmm. so yeah yeah it was worthwhile becoming uh, friendly with them and getting to know them brilliant stuff well cheers for sharing that story of your time in bosnia there tony but yeah it's been a while since we actually uh had the original interview what have you been up to yeah. since um I'm, I'm deciding that i'm going to retire from being retired <laughs> because i'm working too hard to be quite honest um i help run a hospital car service in in the village that takes two days a week because we're 15 miles from the nearest hospitals 
Wow. Um, and quite a lot of these centres of excellence uh, are from hospitals that are further apart. So I might be going to Nottingham, which is 35 miles away, or Leicester or Peterborough wow. uh, to take somebody. Uh, the latest one is this uh, Brig, which does um, eyes, effectively. It's a specialist eye uh, centre. So, yeah, I do that twice a week, play golf twice a week. I still referee rugby twice a week. So that's six days. <laughs> and You're a tire sim, Tony. That's without doing anything else. <laughs> I know uh, Craig West has, has come back to Airliner World as uh, editor, uh, and he texted me saying, you know, give us a shout if you're free, because, I mean, I've got a couple of things, you know, you could help us out with, and to my detriment, I haven't yet. Because I just haven't had the time, you know. It's, well, once uh, you retire, retired, you can get onto your next yes, project. I well, I'm going to go back to work, so I, I didn't get <laughs> Well, no. bloody hell, Tony! It sounds like you're a busy man, but uh, yeah, yeah, thanks again for coming on the show. It's been a privilege and an honour to talk to you as usual. So, thanks very oh. much, mate.